Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, the defendant has pled guilty to two counts of murder in the first degree as to counts three and four of the indictment. Consequently, you will not concern yourselves with the question of his guilt. The punishment for these crimes is either death or life imprisonment without the possibility of parole. The final decision as to what punishment shall be imposed rests solely with the judge of this court. That's me. However, the law requires that you, the jury, render to the court an advisory sentence as to what punishment should be imposed upon the defendant. The law also requires the court to give great weight to your sentencing recommendation. I may reject your sentencing recommendation only if the facts are so clear and convincing that virtually no reasonable person could differ. The state and the defendant may now present evidence relative to the nature of the crime and the character of the defendant. You are instructed that this evidence is presented in order that you might determine first whether sufficient aggravating circumstances exist that would justify the imposition of the death penalty, and second, whether there are mitigating circumstances sufficient to outweigh the aggravating circumstances, if any. At the conclusion of the taking of the evidence and after argument of counsel, you will be instructed on the factors in aggravation and mitigation that you may consider. As I have earlier instructed you, the defendant has the absolute right to remain silent. From the exercise of the defendant's right to remain silent, a jury is not permitted to draw any inference, and the fact that a defendant did not take the witness stand must not influence your advisory verdict in any manner. At this time, the attorneys are going to make opening statements to you. You'll recall, if they choose, you'll recall that we told you opening statements give the attorneys a chance to tell you what evidence they believe will be presented during this phase of this trial. What the lawyers say is not evidence, it is not instruction on the law, and you should not consider it as such. We'll ask you to give both sides your careful attention. Mr. King. Thank you. Last week when you were here, as we began this process, each and every one of you swore an oath. That oath said, in essence, that you would become responsible to make a decision, and that you would make a decision that in this case spoke two things, truth and justice. This part of the trial is for us to give you an overview of what we expect to show you in the case. Our case to you on behalf of the state of Florida will be narrow, it will be hopefully concise, and it will be directed towards showing you two things the circumstances surrounding the events that led to the death of Richard Windorf and Naomi Queen, and to specific, what we have called throughout the course of this, aggravating circumstances. And the judge at the close of the trial will tell you what they are. But that is going to be the focus of the state of Florida's case. We will not attempt to set forth to you, as I told you early on, that these murders were the result of a vampire or of a cult. What we intend to show you is that these murders were the result of choice of a decision. They were the result of a personal decision of a person. That person was Rod Farrell. So the context of our case to you will be the context of choice, of decisions, and of responsibility for those decisions.
you will first of all, as a part of this case, hear the circumstances of the crimes which now Mr. Farrell has admitted that he committed. Burglary, which is entering someone else's home without their consent with the intent to commit a crime in their home. Robbery, taking someone's property against their will by the use or threat of force. And murder, that is taking someone's life by an act that was premeditated. What you are also going to hear through the course of the state's evidence and the testimony are how these crimes were committed, the context of the crimes that gives rise to the aggravating circumstances that we talked about. We will show you that they were committed after Mr. Farrell had been convicted of what? that the sentencing today actually is after he was convicted of another capital felony. Now it sounds strange, but the proof of that is going to be in the judgment and sentence of this court where he was a judge guilty for murder. And that is something you can consider in imposing sentence here today, that he committed two separate murders. You're going to hear evidence to show you that, that these murders were committed during the course of an armed robbery, the entry into the home. You're going to hear that these murders were committed in order to avoid or prevent an arrest or to help effect an escape. You're going to hear that the murders were committed for financial gain. You're going to hear that the way these murders were committed or what the law calls especially heinous, atrocious, cruel. And you will also hear that these murders were not just premeditated, that is at the time of the killing there was an intent to kill, but they were pre-planned before the burglary ever took place. They were cold, calculated, and premeditated murders. Now, to show you those proofs, we have, in essence, for the state of Florida, divided the evidence into five parts. And what we will try to do to, for you is to keep those parts together so that as you assimilate all of this testimony and all of these documents over the course of time, you can fit them with their part. But I can also tell you that's not exactly going to happen because there are expert witnesses that you will hear from, some of those people from out of the state of Florida. So we have to arrange with their schedule to get them here when we can get them here. So some of it will be somewhat out of place. But within the overall context of the trial, look for five things that the state of Florida will show you through the testimony what Mr. Farrell did, first of all, the murders themselves. Look at the evidence that he left behind in the home of Richard and Naomi Windorf that shows you that he did it. Look at what he was even doing here that set this into motion. Look at where he went to after the murders occurred. And finally, look at what he said about the murders that he committed. Those are the five areas that we will present to you. The presentation will start with what he did. What you will hear is that at the Windorf home, there was Richard, Naomi, Jennifer, and Heather. On the evening of November the 25th, 1996, Jennifer came home fairly mid-evening, about nine o'clock or so in the evening. When she came home, she found something that to her was a startling event. 
she walked into the house and she finds there was a call placed to the emergency 911 line and because of that call Deputy Taylor responds to the scene he secures the scene the home he obviously goes in to check to see what is there what the situation is so that he can know who to call what other help he needs if there's anybody else in the home all of those things that you would, would expect a policeman to do he did and once he had determined there was nobody else in the home no perpetrators there that it was obvious that both mr windorf and miss queen were dead he steps out of the house secures the scene and waits for the investigators to arrive and they do arrive right around midnight that night you will hear that farley caudell typically called jake arrived at the scene and began the process of entering the house to find exactly what was there what the situation was and to collect the evidence and i think you're going to hear that 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 process in and of itself took hours and hours to get to the house than to get into the house because of their concern about disturbing any evidence that they were going to take photographs they were going to do everything the way things ought to be done for them to get into the house and it isn't until the next afternoon that the medical examiner dr hare is even allowed into the house to initially check the bodies where they lay so that she can examine and determine what's what's there what is significant to her as the medical examiner the bodies are then removed she takes the bodies not personally but through her company to the org and an autopsy is performed and you're going to hear her describe for you the beating that both mr windorf and miss queen suffered in this case and it is not going to be pretty but it's a fact that you have to consider and you're going to be asked to look at that and that ladies and gentlemen will be the proof of what he did now what did he leave you will hear from mr caudell and mr binkley who was another evidence technician for the lake county sheriff's office that there was a process by which that they began to collect evidence both at the scene of the house and at the autopsy where the bodies were examined and part of what you will hear is that in the house on the kitchen floor there were footprints shoe prints technically they were boot prints on the kitchen floor both just on the floor in what we call a latent print that is something that's left in the course of movement but that there were two others they were in blood and they were immediately at the right hand side of naomi queen and you will hear from the evidence that they were the boots that rod farrell was wearing what else did he leave he left another piece of evidence not in the house but on miss queen he didn't leave that evidence intentionally because the facts will show that as part of this event miss queen who confronts him in the house recognizes what's going on and scratches his face and from the autopsy you will hear that her fingernails were collected and that underneath her fingernails was genetic material dna evidence matches rod farrell you will hear 
what he left at the scene that proves what he did. You're also going to hear, to some extent, about why he was here, what he was doing here. You're going to hear from friends of his that he was here from Kentucky, having moved away in December of 1995, that he was here, as he called it, on a road trip. You're going to hear from a young na lady named Shannon Yogi and a young lady named Audrey Preston, if she makes it back from New York, that they both saw her, saw Mr. Farrell, along with another person named Scott Anderson, with Dana Cooper, and with Charity Cassie, who most people call Shay, that they saw those four both Sunday night and Monday. November the 24th and the 25th, that they were down here visiting. I expect that you will hear Ms. Preston say that as a part of the conversation with her, Mr. Farrell, and Mr. Anderson, that there was a discussion about something big that was going to happen the next night, Monday night the night that Mr. Windorf and Ms. Queen were killed. I expect that you may well hear that, they, that that group of four were here in part to help Heather Windorf and Janine LeClaire run away from home, and that that was part of their purpose the purpose of Mr. Farrell, Mr. Anderson, Ms. Cooper, and Ms. Cassie in being in Florida. And you're going to hear about that. You will also hear that after the murders occurred and Mr. Farrell's explorer was taken from the home as well as some of his credit cards, that this group of what turns out to be five, Mr. Farrell, Mr. Anderson, Ms. Cooper, Ms. Cassie, and now Heather Windorf, travel from Eustis, Florida, to New Orleans, Louisiana, and Baton Rouge, Louisiana. And part of that you will see, I believe, that Mr. Windorf's credit card was used in Tallahassee to buy something at Walmart and to buy gas at an Amico station, and again used out in the Panhandle near Crestview to buy gas on November the 26th, 1996, the day after he was killed. What you will hear also is that because of the investigation that was ongoing, the Lake County Sheriff's Office had put out information to be on the lookout for this explorer with the Kentucky tag and with these five people inside. And that as a part of that information and the search for this vehicle that the Baton Rouge Police Department began an investigation based on a phone call that had been made from Baton Rouge to Ms. Cassie's, one of Ms. Cassie's relatives, and that as a result of that investigation, the Baton Rouge Police Department found those five people and Mr. Windorf's Ford Explorer backed into a parking space at a Ramada Inn in Baton, Louise, Baton Rouge, Louisiana on Thanksgiving evening, 1996. That's what you're going to hear about, where they went. Finally, you're going to hear about what Mr. Farrell said about these events. Not just what he said about them after the event, what he said about it before the event. You're going to hear from Ms. Shannon Yohe that on Monday, before they left to go get Janine LeClaire and Heather Windorf to run away. 
that Rod Farrell was already talking about killing Mr. and Mrs. Windorf or Ms. Queen in order to take their car because they needed to pick a car. And that there was discussion among him and Mr. Anderson in Shannon Yohe's presence that that's what they were going to do. You are also going to hear that in Baton Rouge, after he was arrested, that he made two statements. One to Sergeant Ben Odom of the Baton Rouge Police Department, and one to Al Gussler of the Lake County Sheriff's Office. In both of those statements, he details having determined to kill the Windor family going into the house, finding a crowbar, going into the home itself out of the garage, finding Mr. Windorf asleep on the couch, and beating him to death with that crowbar. And then, after he has finished that murder, he turns to be confronted by Naomi Queen in the kitchen. He's going to tell you that there was a short <coughs> verbal exchange. She threw her coffee on him. She scratched him in the face. And he beat her with the crowbar. The evidence will show you that she crossed the kitchen, dripping blood, fell in the doorway between the kitchen and the dining room and that he beat her, and he beat her, and he beat her, until literally he beat her brains out. That's what he's going to tell you that he did on that night in that house. All of those proofs are going to go to show you the circumstances of the murder, the planning that went into them, the reasons that went into them, the effect that they had on the people that were killed, the heinous, atrocious, and cruel nature of the crimes. Those facts are going to prove to you the aggravating circumstances. The defense is going to have the opportunity to prove to you what are called mitigating circumstances. And while I would not presume to know exactly what they're going to tell you, part of it I know because of the documentation of the case. I expect that they're going to call mental health professionals to you to have them talk to you about Mr. Farrell's upbringing, and his IQ, and his mental disorders, and those kinds of things. And what I would caution you in that regard is to treat them like you treat every other witness. Listen to what they had the ability to know for a fact. And listen to how they used those facts in arriving at any conclusion. Because they are like everybody else. They come to you with some presumption of expertise, but listen to what they had to work with and how they worked with it. And I think you'll see that the saying is true. You put garbage in, you can't help. Thank you. You can't help but get garbage out. So listen carefully as they talk to you about what tests they did, what they talked to Mr. Farrell about and how they came to arrive at their conclusion. Because that's going to be important in your assessment of their credibility. And in the end, you weigh. You determine. No one determines for you. You determine what verdict will speak truth and justice in this case. Thank you.
morning, ladies and gentlemen. <coughs> Last week about this time, I, young Rod Farrell came up here in front of this court and entered a guilty plea to the charges against him. You were not here for that. We're going to try to show you the videotape of that, where he came up here, even though he's just a kid, and admitted and pled guilty to the charges against him. Okay? This is for you to determine the appropriate sentence for Rod Farrell, who at the time of the offenses was 60 years old. Okay? And we talked with you, remember back on Boyd Dyer, when I stood right there and talked to you about the mitigators and about age, and we talked about that. The judge, I think, is going to give you an instruction on that. There's going to be a lot of evidence come in about age, in particular Rod Farrell's age. Remember you were told last week that a person under 16 years of age who commits a capital crime cannot be put to death in Florida, okay? The evidence is going to show that at the time of this offense, Rod Farrell was about 16 years and eight months old. I think if you calculate, it's about 243, 244 days. We submit to you that through the witnesses, records, and everything, you will see that age will definitely be a big, if not the determining factor. <clears throat> We're also going to show you a pattern of trying to show you where Rod came from. He was born in Murray, Kentucky, which is Callaway County, which is in the western part of the state. Uh, if you're not familiar with that, it's just south of Paducah, Kentucky. It's toward what they call the tri-state area of Kentucky, Illinois, and Missouri. He also spent a lot of time down here in Central Florida. He went to garden in Eustis. <clears throat> He's gone by the name of Rod, Roddy, and also a name that he took as a vampire called Visago, V-E-S-A-G-O. We're also gonna to talk to you about how Rod Farrell got involved in some of these fantasy games, about his involvement, his role playing, especially at Murray State University in 1995, 1996. These became, these almost consumed his life. And he got involved in them. <clears throat> what happened to Rod is his world of fantasy mismatched with reality because his life was painful, very painful. We're going to show you that you're going to hear some horrible information about Rod's life. And it culminated back on that Monday night, November the 25th, 1996, at Mr. Wendorf's and Miss Naomi Queen's house. You're gonna hear a lot of witnesses come on this witness stand today. And remember what I told you back in Boy Dyer, you're gonna, now y'all are sitting there, it's gonna be coming at y'all. Before we were getting you to come to us and talk to us. You're gonna be sitting here, you're gonna hear witnesses probably start, well, I'm gonna we'll try to be brief, but in a few minutes, you're gonna have a lot of evidence come in. His mother will testify, a lot of his schoolmates, a lot of his friends, law enforcement's gonna be here, uh, law enforcement from different places, several doctors who've been evaluating Rod over the course of the last 15 months. Not only evaluating, but testing him, interviewing him, and getting as much data as they can fed to them from other sources, whether it be depositions, witness statements, school records, or whatever. I think we'll let you decide about what the doctors had to make their opinions. Give you the three names of the doctors. One guy's by the name of Dr. Wade Myers, who is an analytic adolescent psychiatrist at the University of Florida. Uh, he has done a tremendous amount of work with adolescents. Uh, we're also going to have a lady by the name of Dr. McMahon come in. She did a lot of testing. She's a psychologist, not a psychiatrist. Dr. Myers is a medical doctor who specializes in psychiatry. Dr. McMahon is a psychologist, also another psychologist by the name of Dr. Harry Kropp. Both of these psychologists uh, have tremendous experience you'll be able to hear about in the area of what we call forensic psychology, the study of people who are charged with crimes. I think it's very important for you to realize that they had a lot of information provided to them. Depositions, witness statements, police reports, videotapes, everything. So much was provided to them so to reach their conclusions. Okay? You're going to see medical records, school records, phone records, a lot of phone records here between Murray and also Eustis, Florida, right down here. 
photos and other evidence. You're going to have a lot of this coming at you. Okay? You're going to have a tremendous amount of evidence coming at you. You're going to hear how Rod, as I said, spent his life between Central Florida and Murray, Kentucky, up there, and also spent some time in a little town community called Hazel, Kentucky. You're going to hear how he was abused as a child. He was exposed to these fantasy violent games. That basically Rod was abandoned by his dad at a very young age. You should hear by video deposition, though, a lady by the name of Betty Jane Farrell, who lives in West Virginia, his paternal grandmother. And you'll see the, what kind of lady she was. She'd have a chance to take a part in his life. <clears throat> You're also going to remember, ladies and gentlemen, you're, you're, we talked about your decision-making making function. Okay, a lot of you talked about here. I know we got a lot of engineers here. Uh, and I know what goes in before you make your conclusions and everything like that. But your decision-making function is very important here because we're going to ask you in this point to give Rod life because that's what he wants. You got, you're going to have a lot of witnesses coming to you. Rod was born stillborn with the umbilical cord around his neck. He suffered a severe case of encephalitis as a young man, as a young boy. He wasn't even expected to live. He even suffered some head traumas before the incident on November the 25th, 1996. One thing that we talked to you about is his drug use. In his early teens, he used quite a bit of drugs. He doesn't deny that. We, we talked with you about that on opening state, on Boyd Iron. Uh, he dealt with acid, Prozac, and marijuana. He also drank alcohol on a regular basis. And you're going to how, how the, hear how the drugs and the alcohol and the other things in his life came to effect on November the 25th of 1996. The doctors are going to testify about a personality disorder Rod has called schizotypal personality disorder. This overlaps, these traits sometimes overlap with schizophrenia, which goes almost to the in psychosis. Dr. Myers is going to give you the definition of that. He's going to explain to you how he came to that conclusion the factors he used, the evidence that was supplied to him to get to that conclusion. <clears throat> You'll hear that these mental illnesses and other problems Rod has suffered were a contributing factor to the night of November the 25th, 1996. <clears throat> You're going to get to some of the aggravating evidence. Also, the state's going to present it. We have an idea what they're going to do, but that's their shot, okay? We're going to submit to you that some of these aggravators are not going to be there. Okay, the state's not going to meet their burden of proof, which Judge Lockett's going to talk to you on, about the burden of proofs and then how you weigh things. And remember the word we use there, and I, I made it a point to talk to y'all. It's outweigh, not outnumber, okay? We figure when, you, when, you, when we get back to you, when you hear all the mitigation of how this event occurred, and one way you're going to know about this event occurred, because number one, Rod Farrell came up here last Thursday, but we could go and admit it to him. Number two, to the Baton Rouge police, in particular Ashton Tommy Dewey, one of the officers who arrested him, and also Sergeant Ben Oldham, who was a lead investigator in Baton Rouge, he admitted to them what he'd done. He admitted this to them. He cooperated with them. And within approximately 20 hours later, when Wayne Longo and Al Gustler of the Lake County Sheriff's Office got there to do their interview, he also admitted it to them. That's one reason why you're gonna know so much about this case, is because Rod Farrell admitted it, just like he admitted it last Thursday morning here. We believe that when you come back, you will see after the evidence is presented, the aggravators, the mitigators, at this time this young 16 year old boy should be sentenced to life twice with no possibility of parole. Thank you all.